begin our time together, I'd like to read from Psalm 98. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He's remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praise to the Lord with a lyre, with a lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets, the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Drought and storm, what I 
I want you to know right now is a time for us to stand in the power of Christ. Amen. 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 We are living in a nightmare. Actually, there are two nightmares going on in America right now. COVID coming back is a nightmare. We prayed this morning, we prayed particularly uh, uh, for Billy Highsmith to Attended our eight, attends our 8.30 service. He's in bad shape. They fl- they've taken him to Rex Hospital from Cape Fear with uh, COVID, blood clots in his legs, and, and uh, he needs our prayers. But COVID is becoming a nightmare. But there's another nightmare of our making, and that's Afghanistan. That's a nightmare. We've got brothers and sisters in Christ there, and we need to pray for them. We need to pray for the 82nd Airborne. We're praying for them. God would protect them, help them to remove our citizens from that danger zone. And that's why they're there. Give wisdom to those that are leading. 
bring our folks there, out of there, out of that nightmare safely. We also pray today for Dan Hignight, Ann Boswell, Layla Jackson, who's been battling COVID, Shirley Souter, Shirley Bayrath, Glenda Frazee. Let's pray for our neighbors in the mountains who are also having uh, a great deal of difficulty with, with the flooding. And then this morning, Janie Two's sister passed away. And Janie, we're praying for your family, lifting you up. Uh, we know we've been praying on Wednesday night for her sister. Let's pray for, for Janie and her family as they travel this week there uh, to be there with family. As we bow today, the world might give us a nightmare, but we know who, where the power of God is. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, as we join together today, we pray for the people of Afghanistan who are walking in a terribly fearful time. And Lord, fear is of the enemy. Your perfect love casts out fear. And Lord, during this fearful time in Afghanistan, we cannot imagine the terrors that they're facing. We've got soldiers there. We've got believing brothers and sisters there. We've got American citizens there. And Father, we are praying a prayer covering over the 82nd Airborne and our citizens and our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for the courage to stand for those Christians who will now have to take a stand. We pray for protection. We pray for Isaiah 41, 10 through 12 that says, You said to Israel, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Be with them, we pray, as their shield. Romans 8 says, When we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit will intercede for us. And Lord, we just don't know how to pray perfectly for those there, but we lift them before you. And we think about those walking in fear of COVID right here. Every day we see people afraid. And I pray, Father, that you would take fear out of our hearts and let our confidence be in Christ and in Christ alone. We are seeing today pictures of what a Christ-like world looks like. When people without Christ take over a country, and Lord, we can only imagine what will happen if they take over a world. Father, we thank you Jesus is coming soon, but the world, when Jesus takes us out, is going to be worse than we're seeing it now. I pray, Father, for you to work a miracle. And I pray, Father, that as the gates of hell are being unleashed in this world, that you would open the windows of heaven. And open those windows right here in our hearts today that we can give our burdens to you Lift our hearts and heads to you. Hear your word of confidence today for us. And I pray, Father, that you would meet with us in this place and remind us how much a Lord you are as we give ourselves to you in these moments of worship, saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. In his name, amen. You may be seated. You probably felt like you've been standing a long time. That's all right. With all the bad news in the world, let me give you some good news. How about some good news? I, on Monday night, uh, we met over at the Blanchard's house. Thank you. We appreciate the Blanchard's letting us use their swimming pool for Jesus. And uh, we wanted to baptize Landon Frazee before he went off to that, up to, off to school. We want him covered in Jesus. He gave his life to Christ, and we got him baptized before he went off to school. And I just want to let you know, praise the Lord, we're planning more baptisms, folks. I know some of our youth were baptized by the youth leader at the beach, and your parents weren't there. We want to baptize them here, all right? And so uh, we want, if your child was baptized there, parents, you deserve to be there. We're going to have a baptism for them here. Uh, call the office. Let us know. And uh, we're going to have another baptism in just a couple of weeks before it turns cold weather. 
We want to make sure we have a really great baptism. So that's for you. We're celebrating that. Next Sunday is one I'm looking forward to. Can't wait till next Sunday night. Choir has a wonderful presentation for the community, not just us. Invite your friends to come. We're going to have ice cream afterwards. We want you to make a freezer of ice cream. And that's my favorite time. We're going to have a great freezer of ice cream and enjoy some fellowship afterwards. Please uh, come and bring some ice cream. Looking forward to it. I have appointed myself the uh, taste tester for every one of those. <laughs> and uh, I am looking forward to assuming that awesome responsibility. Uh, next, uh, Wednesday night, church conference. Don't forget that. We still have our meal at 6, and we'll have church conference, uh, excuse me, meal at 5, church conference at 6 o'clock. And uh, that last song we just sang, we're reminding us we're in the power of Christ. Thank you for choir, for that music. And uh, let's continue to worship the Lord. In the word of God, let us turn to Mark chapter 5, please. Mark chapter 5, 
the Word of God. We're going to read verse 1 through 19, if you'll make your way there. I have a question for you this morning. What kind of impact have you made on this world for Christ? Or better yet, what kind of impact are you making on this world? I saw something this week that kind of captured my attention. A, uh, it was a gravestone on a lady's grave. Now, you know, what? if you've been to a cemetery, a gravestone usually contains the name, date of birth, and date of death, and a sentiment. But this lady had a, her own gravestone made. And on it, all she had was her fudge recipe. Her name was Kay, and the title was Kay's Reci Fudge Recipe. I guess it was so good. Had the eggs on there, and the flour, and the chocolate, and how much to do everything, and how to make her fudge recipe. I guess she said in her life, You'll never, I'll never tell you until I die. <laughs> so when she died, she put it on her grave. That way they all had to come to the funeral, I guess. I don't know. But that's how she touched lives. How are you touching lives? Have you thought about that? How do I, Jesus touched lives. And one way he did it was Jesus was an encourager. One way you can touch lives is by being an encourager. Are you an encourager or a discourager? Now, we're in a series, this summer series is just like Jesus. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to have to be encouragers. And I have found this. One word of encouragement during failure is worth more than a thousand words of praise. I have found that we spend more time congratulating successful people than encouraging people who really need it. I wish our kids had more encouragement. I read of a young man, 15 years old, he said that he was told he had leukemia at 15. His parents took him to a great hospital, and there was that hospital, millions of dollars worth of equipment, best doctors in the world, and they told him, you're going to lose your hair. You're going to get bloated. It's going to be painful. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's a long treatment to treat your leukemia. He said his aunt sent him some flowers. And in that flower, in those flowers, he found another note. I want to read you the note that was in the flowers. It said, Douglas, I took your order. I work at Bricks Florist. I had leukemia when I was seven years old. And I'm 22 now. Good luck. My heart goes out to you. Sincerely, Laura Bradley. And he said all the doctors and all the medicines and all the promises didn't help him. But he said that one note lifted his heart and gave him the courage to face all those treatments. She touched his life. Why do we need encouragers today in this world? Let me tell you why. And I think you'll agree with me. We need to be encouragers in this world because we are living in a put-down world. You know it. We're living in a world where they're putting you down. You have to talk right, think right, act right, dress right, be right, or somebody's going to criticize you, scrutinize you, reject you, and put you down. Now they're even trying to get you fired for something you said 20 years ago because it may not be acceptable today. We're living in a put-down world. And by the way, these woke folks that are out there are the biggest villains of put down of all. And I'll tell you this, you might be woke, but you better wake up to Jesus or you're going to wake up in hell. We need to be woke to Christ. Today, the value of encouragement. There was a book written by two Catholic professors, Cliff Notarius, Howard Markman, entitled, We Can Work It Out. Sounds like a Beatles song, doesn't it? <laughs> we can work it out. Never mind. 
It was a book on marriage. And they did an analysis of how married people talk to each other. And they measured the number of critical comments in a marriage on a certain time, weekly, monthly basis. And they found that the higher the criticism in speech, the more likelihood they're going to break up. And the lower the criticism and the greater the encouragement, the more likely they're going to make it. You've got to realize the power of your words are, are important. And here's my refrigerator quote today. When you leave, if you're visiting today, welcome. We always give a refrigerator quote to remember uh, to, to, to think about this week. And here it is today. It's, it's at baskets as you leave. Here's a refrigerator quote to put on the refrigerator. Don't put anyone down until you put them down on your prayer list. If they're not on your prayer list, you don't need to put them down at all, right? But I made a mistake on this. I had it printed. Sure, okay, it's early in the year. I made one mistake this year. Okay. <laughs> don't put anyone down on your prayer list, I wrote, until you put them down on your prayer list first. Now, that first at the end, strike it out, please, because it sounds like once you put them on your prayer list, then you can really tear them up. But that, 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 <laughs> that's not what I intend with this, all right? That's not what I intend. God has designed life so that we cannot live it alone. It was not good for Adam to be alone. We need each other, and we need people to lift us up. Somebody asked Thomas Edison why he needed so many assistants. He said, because I can't figure everything out by myself. And that's the way it is with life. I was sitting in the Seattle, Washington airport two weeks ago. And uh, as you know, if you've been to the airport recently, everybody's got a, a phone, a laptop, or a pad. And they're always looking for some place to charge it. Well, in Seattle airport, they got chargers under the seat. And I just happened to be sitting in a section where they weren't working. And so a lady sits across from me, and she tries to plug it in. It's not working. And her phone is nearly dead. When uh, she begins to complain a little bit about it, and the lady sitting beside her said, those plugs don't work. He, she said, here that she was a total stranger. She opened her pocketbook, pulled out a little device, a little rectangular device about that thick. It was a battery charger. And she just put her phone on that charging, whatever it was, and it charged her battery. Now, when I saw that, my preacher headlights went on. I said, there's a sermon illustration. That lady gave her a battery boost. And I thought, Man, I can't wait to preach and ask, are you a battery booster or are you a battery drainer? Jesus was a battery booster. Look at the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, you shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be fed. Jesus was a battery booster. They were fishing, caught nothing. Pull it in their nets. They'd fished all night, given up. And Jesus said, throw your nets on the other side. And man, their hearts were overwhelmed. Jesus was a battery booster. He called Peter Rocky. Remember? He said, Peter, your name is now Cephas, a rock. I, I named him Rocky, okay? Rocky. He called James and John the sons of thunder. Encouragement. Now, I've got some names for some of y'all, but I'm not mentioning that right now. But listen, he was an encourager. The woman caught in adultery. He didn't condemn her. He did command her, but he didn't condemn her. The father of the left epileptic boy, I can't believe. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible. Listen. Here's a definition of an encourager. An encourager is someone who helps people see what's possible in Christ. You and I are called to help people see what's 
can be possible in Christ. An encourager sees what somebody else can't see. Because sometimes we're, we're blind to what God can do and God wants us to do. And the impact that you can make is being an encourager. Now I've got to tell you my favorite, I always start with a good little story. Y'all love my stories. Uh, there was a pastor who had a male parrot. And his male parrot could only speak two words. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. He wanted him to expand his vocabulary. Pastor found out he had a lady in his church that had a female parrot. And talking one day, she said, my parrot only says, let's kiss. Let's kiss. Preacher said, let's put them together. Maybe they'll learn some new words together. She said, okay. Nice little experiment. So they put the female parrot in with the male parrot. The first thing that happens is the female parrot says, let's kiss. The male parrot looks at her and says, praise the Lord. My prayers have been answered. <laughs> now that's encouragement, isn't it? I want to share with you today one of the most important lessons you'll ever have on touching lives. I want you to learn how to touch lives the way Jesus did. I want you to learn how to encourage people the way Jesus did. And this scripture is about a wild man. It's an extreme case, but an important case for us. Because at what Jesus did, we're always called to do. So let's look at this case and, and take note of what Jesus did. Mark chapter 5, verse 1 says, And then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, lived in cemeteries. No one could bind him, not even with chains, because he'd often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could either one tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. Our kids are cutting themselves. What spirit leads to cutting? Just note. And when he saw Jesus afar off from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you. Now notice he, that's the confession he had to make of Jesus. I implore you, by God, that you do not torment me. Even demons are scared of hell. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him, them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains, so all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently, violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Let me tell you something. Evil thinking will run a country over the cliff too, not just pigs. Our thinking, wrong thinking, will lead a country over a cliff. Let's go on. So those who fed the swine and they those who fed the swine and they told it uh, to the city and the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed, now watch, and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. I use this for Alzheimer's patients. Somebody dies with Alzheimer's, you might have a loved one. He's clothed in his right mind. 
Jesus restores minds. At, and he can do it. He was sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it had happened to him, who had been demon possession, about the swine. And then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. What a story of touching lives. Encouragers are life touchers. Now, today I want you to note, write down five things. Touching lives, being an encourager like Jesus. There are five things that you need to know. To encourage like Jesus. First of all, write down, Jesus drew near. Notice Jesus drew near. He got close. This man was a maniac. This man was an unloving. He was rejecting everything of God. And as Jesus got close, he said, get away from me, Jesus. Jesus didn't do it. He got closer to him, didn't he? We've got to learn a lesson. Because this man represents our world today that is hostile to Christ. We are living in a world that's like this man. We're living in a world that's going crazy with anger. And they're trying to drive us off. Jesus did not, was not driven off. He drew near to, to that rejecting person. He dialogued with that rejecting person. He didn't clam up and he didn't give up. Rejection did not stop Jesus and it cannot stop us. If we're going to change this world, look what Jesus did. If we're going to change this world and win this world, we're going to have to press through rejection and hostility and unloving hearts. Notice what Jesus did. He did not write this man off. How many people do we write off? If anybody should have been written off, this guy was naked, crying out, cutting himself. He was the worst of the worst. But Jesus didn't write him off. And don't you write yourself off. I don't care what's going on in your heart. Don't write yourself off. Jesus can change it. Jesus was not afraid. We're going to have to be fearless in these last days. Jesus found a way to engage this guy. And I believe we have to do the same. I told you before about Jeff Merck, my friend. We were getting ready to go into to work in the military in a top security area and at lunchtime and Jeff was reading a book, Ripley's Believe It or Not. And I stood up and saw him read. I was standing beside him as we were going in, and I said, you're reading Ripley's Believe It or Not? Y'all know what that is? I said, you believe that? He said, well, yeah. I said, it's funny you'll believe that and not, not in Jesus and in the Bible. And he said, who? I said, Jesus. He said, who's that? That night I led him to Jesus Christ. Found a way to engage him. Listen, never let rejection keep you from representing Jesus. We're to represent Jesus no matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter how belligerent, belligerent they are. He was still winning on the cross. Jesus did not reject people. Draw near. Here's the second thing. If you're going to be an encourager, you've got to say some right words. Jesus spoke to this man. Listen, how often do we say and do we speak what we want to say instead of speaking what needs to be said? We're living in a day when everybody just speaks their heart. We need to stop speaking our heart, speaking what Jesus once said. Jesus spoke some redeeming words. I want to tell you something. When I was working on my doctorate, 
my doctorate was on, uh, you had to come up with a hypothesis, and my hypothesis was about measuring the self-esteem of believers as they discovered their spiritual gifts. A bunch of stuff you got to do. I had a control group that I was studying. I put them through a class on learning their spiritual gifts, and then they had to go apply their spiritual gifts. We measured it, whatever. We were sitting in a circle one day with that group, and one person in frustration just said, I don't have any gifts. I don't have any. And somebody in the group said, oh, yes, you do. And, I'll, and said, you do this in church, and I see that, and people are blessed, and you do this in church, and people are blessed. And the person was shocked, said, really? And I got an idea. I said to the next person, I said, let's talk about him. <laughs> What do you see him doing in church? And they began to say to one another, you, this is how you've blessed me. This is how you've blessed me. And you know what? Did more than all my teaching. It humbled me. Did more than all my teaching had done. One day I was playing a game with my son when he was a little boy. And at the end of the game, which of course I let him win, my little boy looked at me and said, sincerely, Dad, tell me I'm a winner. And I wondered how many children are wanting to hear the words, you're a winner. My son just needed to hear his dad say, you're a winner. You're good. You're a great kid. I love you. When did we stop saying the needed words and just saying the wanted words, the words we want to say? John Maxwell said, a word of encouragement from a teacher can change a child's life. A word of encouragement from a spouse can change and save a marriage. A word of encouragement from a leader or friend can inspire a person to reach potential. And Jesus had three kinds of words. Words of belief. Words of healing. And words of devotion and worship. Now, sadly, as I look at this church today, I don't know your backgrounds, but I know something else. Some of you grew up in a highly critical atmosphere. Some of you grew up with critical parents. No matter what you did, you couldn't measure up to their standards. You tried and tried and tried, but you never could do it. And that affected you deeply. Some of you are embroiled in a highly critical marriage. Most of the conversations are criticism, not blessing. You're never good enough. You're not this. You're not that. You're not them. Have you ever heard that? You're not them. You, I want you to be like them. I want you to be like this. I want you to be like that. Well, you can't be that, and you can't be them, but you can be you. And you've got to love each other as you. Or you're at work and the same's going on. Listen, you need to stop listening to people and start listening to Jesus. Because Jesus saw something in this man that nobody else did. He saw a man that could be loved. And that's how we need to see people. Not only did he draw near and say the right words, but third, he gave him some heart talk. This man needed heart talk. You see, when Jesus first approached this guy, he cast the demon out and it didn't go. Well, maybe one did, but there was a legion in him. And Jesus immediately sees, wait, there's more in his heart than I realized. So Jesus then says, who's in there? What's in your heart? And the demon speaks and says, there's a legion of us in here. He so, said, I didn't know that, in essence. He had to have a heart talk. He had to find out what was in that guy's heart. Jesus helped him get that stuff out of his heart. Some of you in this church, listen, the poison in your heart will come out your mouth. Can I say that again? <laughs> poison words are from a poison heart. This guy's poison was coming out for Jesus. 
You say, what's in your heart? What did Jesus do then? He changed his heart. He gave him a new heart. Now, I want you to learn this. He valued that guy. First thing he valued, he communicated that guy, you're valuable. By the way, can I tell you about, I read this week about a prankster who broke into a high-end clothing store. Did I tell you about the guy? He broke into a high-end clothing store, and he didn't steal anything. He just changed the price tags. Something $3,000 was a dollar now. He just changed all the price tags, made the expensive stuff cheap. Went in the next day and bought it. Which tells me this. My preacher headlight coming on again. Satan is always changing the price tags of people's lives. The critical world out there is criticizing us, saying you're not valuable. Yes, you are. You're a child of Almighty God. Don't let anybody tell you you're not valuable. Don't let them change your price tag. Not only did he value that man, he took time with that man. If you're going to be an encourager, it's going to take time. He spoke to him twice, found out his root problem. He healed it. Jesus wanted the best for that man. But most of all, he located the root issue. There's sin in your heart that you've got to get out. And that's the root issue. Let me ask a question. How many of you have dandelions in your yard in the spring? Amen? Oh, there's a lot of you don't. Well, I'll give you some of mine. Devil, listen, dandelions are demon possessed. You snap those little suckers off and they come back the next day. You can't get rid of a dandelion unless you get the root. You got to kill that sucker with the root. And Jesus got at the root. And listen, your, your heart's not going to change until you get the root of it. What is it going to take? You're going to have to find the root. And he said, that is, what is the sin that's causing you to be like this? But we're not done yet. He got a new grip. i got to go with this one. Break the grip of that root. To pull that root up, it's going to hold on. You pull up a dandelion, you got to get a, get a grip on that thing and pull it up. Listen, break the grip is a good way to put it. Satan had a strong grip on this guy, a legion of demons. Look at the grip the enemy had. And suddenly Jesus broke that entire grip. And I had to ask the question, how did Jesus do it? How did Jesus break the grip of Satan in his life? How are you going to break the grip of Satan? Here's how. Write this down. When you willingly give God all that you are and all that's in you, You'll break the grip of Satan. Why? Because demons cannot live where Jesus lives. Write it down. Ge demons, the devil, will not live where Jesus lives. You invite Jesus into your heart. You bring his word, put his truth on the throne of your heart, and Satan will go. When Jesus comes in, Satan goes out. Very simple, isn't it? And that's what Jesus did. And I want to ask some of you today, and I, don't, I don't know where you are in this church, come down this altar. The real problem is your heart, not your husband, not your kids, not your wife. The real problem is your heart, and you've got to ask him to grab that by the roots and put a new heart in you, put his word, his truth in your heart. And I want to say something to all our teenagers. Teenagers, look at me and listen. I know that most of them are in their worship service, but those that are here, teenagers, listen. I wish our teenagers and college students would look at this man, this demoniac. What a pathetic creature he is. Look at him. Dirty, nasty, cutting himself, naked, screaming, running wild. How did he get this way? He went to college. 
He got in the party circuit. Not just any time. Yeah. Ah, uh, let's go partying. Okay, man. Let's go party. Let's go. Let's go have some good time. Let me tell you something. He start. Let, let's smoke a little marijuana. Let's uh, take a little drugs. Let's. And suddenly Satan started getting a grip on him. Maybe a finger and a two and three. And the next thing you know, Satan's got his whole life. You realize how it works? Parents, you're going to send your kid to a party school? And you're going to let Satan get a hold of them? And you think you're doing them some good? Be very careful. You've got to ask, what's going to get a hold of my child in this place? This is a, look where, it, show him where it ends up. What a pathetic picture this is. This guy's pitiful. The grip was, listen, the grip of Satan was put on him by disobedience. To break the grip, you only do it by obedience. If it came on by disobedience, you break it by obedience. You've got to break the grip. You've got to get a new grip. And some of you need to come down and say, Jesus, I want you to take hold of my heart. Instead of the stuff that has hold of him. That's not all. Number five, he had to walk the change. There's an after story here. And the after story here is that this man, they come to find the demoniac, he's clothed in his right mind. In other words, Jesus wants you to wear clothes. This is not a Myrtle Beach message, is it? He's clothed and in his right mind. Do you know what he's doing? He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. The Bible says that he's seated at the feet of Jesus. What's he doing? Wait, what's he doing? He's learning how to keep the blessing he just got. When God gives you a blessing, it's not, it, it's not permanent. God's blessing can fade. He's at his feet learning how to keep the blessing. Many people do not bless others and encourage others because they don't have any blessing in their heart. Once you get his blessing in your heart, then you have to become a blesser. Jesus is teaching him how to keep this blessing. That's why we have Sunday school, by the way. Sunday school is a place, is our equipping place. Sunday school is where we sit at the feet of Jesus and we learn, like this guy, how to keep the blessing of our salvation, blessing in our lives and through our lives. But I want you to notice one more thing. Notice the primary place he was to be a blessing. Jesus said, go home and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. He told him where to walk. Home is the first place that you're to be an encourager. If Jesus is real to you, the people at home need to know it and see it first. Go home. Jesus wants our homes blessed. Go home and tell them what the Lord has done for you. By the way, let me just say this. Could you use your holy imagination for just a moment? I want you to imagine something for, with me. I love to use my imagination on Scripture. Imagine you've got a, a relative who's the naked, crazy guy in Fayetteville, North Carolina. You see him running around the streets and being wild and crazy, and everybody says, oh, that's your brother? Oh, that's your son or daughter? And you're sitting on the front porch, and you see him coming. Jesus said, go home. So could you imagine when he came home what it was like? He's coming down the way, and they see him coming. So, oh, no, here he comes. Lock the door. Oh, no, what are we going to do? And he walks up, and he's changed. And he walks up and he's different. And they said, what happened to you? He said, I met a man named Jesus. 
and all the stuff that I got in this household, all the junk that came into my heart, he took out. And I love you folks now. And I want you to know that Jesus healed me and changed me and he gave me a new life. And I want you all to know this, that what Jesus did for that man, he can do for you. That's why it's in the Bible. He can do that very same thing for you. Draw near to him. Let him speak those words to you. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Our chief want of humanity is for someone who will inspire us to be what we know we could be. And that's what Jesus does. Be an encourager. A man died recently, just a little while ago, in Spokane, Washington. His name was uh, Milt Root. Lots of people in Spokane knew Milt. He was a car salesman. Milt Root was a very successful car salesman in, in Spokane, but Milt Root, on weekends with his church, worked with delinquent teenagers living on the streets like this wild guy here did it every weekend worked and tried to get teenagers saved well Milt Rude died a while back and at Milt's funeral one of his friends stood up and he said in his funeral isn't it interesting isn't it interesting Nobody in this entire funeral has asked the question, how many cars did Milt sell? Nobody cared about the car salesman, how many cars he sold, uh, how many cars he sold. They cared about how many lives he touched. And that's what they talked about. And one day you're going to be laying right here. Some preacher's going to be up here trying to tell truth about you. It's going to be hard. How many lives did you touch? Are you more interested in the cars being sold or the work being done or the lawn being mowed or the house being cleaned? Or are you concerned about touching lives? Are we concerned about every dots, all the I's dotted, T's crossed in church? Or are we concerned about lives? We're here to touch lives. Make a commitment to touch a life. And if you're here today, maybe you need to do what this man did with Jesus. And you need to let him have your heart. And I'm going to ask you today to open your heart to him the way this guy did. And to give your junk to Jesus the way this guy gave his junk to Jesus. And that's my invitation today. Because what happened to him can happen to you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a story. Crazy man. There's a lot of people who've asked Jesus into their heart, but they've let junk in since then. Junk that has kept them from shining for Jesus. Lord, we want to dump it all right here today. Uproot it. All that we are, all that we have, we give to Jesus. All that he is, he puts in us. And where he lives, the devil's got to run. So we ask him to come and live in us. And Father, there's some here. Said some words that they need to back up on to loved ones. Pray they'll repent of it. There's some decisions they need to remake to be an encourager. I pray that we'll learn these lessons and be like Jesus to our families, to our neighbors, to our fellow Christians. But if there's somebody here today yearning in their heart to receive what this man received in the text, to, have, to get the junk out of their heart, I pray that right now they'll just say to you where they're sitting, Jesus, come in. I believe as this demoniac fell on his knees and worshiped Jesus, say, you're Lord. 
I believe you're Lord too. I pray that they'll say you died on that cross for me and rose again as proof that you are God in the flesh. Come and pull from the roots the stuff that has soiled my soul. And put your presence in me. Your word in me. Your truth in me. As today in this church I give my life to Jesus. And I will follow him the way this man did. Beginning at home, I'll walk with him the rest of my days. Keeping the blessing of freedom that you bestow. Come into my heart. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to come and stand right here. And I want you to come down and say, Pastor, I've never done this before. I've never given my life to Christ. But just as we had a baptism Monday night, baptized people, and it's a sign that you've done that. You've given your life. Your old life's washed away, and you're rising to new. And Jesus instituted that. Come here and say, Pastor, I've given my life to Christ. If you need to repent of some things, or you just need to get some things out of your heart, the altar's here. It's here on both sides. Come and just kneel and say, Pastor, or Lord, take this stuff out of my heart. And if you want me to pray for you, I'll be here to do that. If you want to join this church from another, you come. Come right here today. As we sing together, you come. I'll be waiting for you. Let's stand together. Come just as you are. special welcome. We uh, Our offering is we have uh, offering boxes at the front and at the door as you leave. So I hope that you'll put Benny and Big Chicks in there. Please do. But uh, we're, that's how we give our offering to the Lord. If you're visiting, fill out a card and put it in one of those boxes as well. Let me just uh, say as well, we got bread, a lot of free bread in the fellowship hall. Go get some bread, please. There's a lot of bread for lunch in there and it's free. Just go grab you a whole handful of it. And uh, it's all bagged up for you, so grab you some free bread for lunch. Also, I want to say this. I, uh, I, I think you need to be educated on something, and, and I, I don't want you to live in ignorance. I really don't. We have, uh, uh, I told someone this morning, I felt like our mayor, his English teacher would be appalled at our mayor in saying that we have a mandate uh, to wear masks in Fayetteville. We don't have a mandate. The mandate is only the word mandate because when you read it, he gets to the very bottom, and I think he hoped you wouldn't read it all. doesn't say mandate. It says this is voluntary. 
<laughs> and it says it clearly, it's voluntary. The police cannot enforce it, except to say, please, it's voluntary. So I want you to know that uh, if you feel like that, uh, that, I encourage you to wear a mask. I encourage you to get a shot. But if you feel like you've had a shot, you've had COVID and you don't need to, we understand you don't have to. We'll respect that. But uh, mandate's a bad word on something that's voluntary. I've never heard of a voluntary mandate. <laughs> I mandate that you volunteer. <laughs> uh, wait a minute, I think I can use that. <laughs> I'm going to mandate that all y'all volunteer. Just, uh, just wanted you to know that. I think it's important that you know that. Let's, uh, as we leave today, go get you some bread. And uh, we should nice our business meeting. We'll be back next week. I've got another sermon next week. I've been holding off on this one. Be here next week for next week's sermon on Just Like Jesus. We've got to learn this one next week. We've got to be here next week. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for reminding us of who he is. Sometimes we forget who Jesus is. He is Lord Supreme over every principality, every power, and every authority. Every authority on earth will bow the knee to our Master Jesus. And Father, let that supremacy be evident in our lives. Continue to touch us with your Spirit, fill us with your Spirit, and use us by your Spirit. As we leave this place today to glorify Him and to live for Him. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go with the song at heart as we sing. Amen.